So, basically in logic we will be concerned with how a proposition follows from a set of other propositions. So, we have to formalize what is for proposition, what is the meaning of follows of and so on. All these things we have to formalize specially. Then we start with what is a proposition, if you say a proposition we are not going to uh, analyze further, we are not going to uh, be looking deeper what is in a proposition like your grammatical things, subjects, predicates and so on, we are not going to do that, we will be starting with the propositions, right. But then it should be very simple logic of propositions as usual something is true, something is false and so on and what is the need for formalization, why do you need to precisely formulate it, right. So, let us see an example, say Jack likes apples or Jack does not like apples. And Jack likes oranges. Consider this proposition. From this, what do you conclude about Jack's liking for fruits? He likes apples, oranges. Yes. Now you have to decide. Well, suppose I think of this this way, right. Now I can say yes, Jack likes oranges, because the first one within those two parentheses, I am not bothered about it, huh? it is anywhere there, it does not matter, whatever it is, is it right. But suppose instead of this, I do it this way. What does it say? Is it definite that he likes oranges? Huh? So, we need precise formulation. Hmm? Is it clear? We will use some sort of things, some punctuation marks like parenthesis, right? And we will not always write all these propositions, the basic ones which are involved in detail we will also symbolize them. Okay. So, we will start with our symbols in this form, we need the punctuation marks left parenthesis, right parenthesis and we may have some connectives like your or and and some others even not. Okay. So, let us have some connectives. You can have other connectives, there are in our languages, but I am not telling what do they mean, right. So, you do not know what are they. You are just introducing some symbols. You can read them, but you will say how to read them, what is their meaning, maybe meaning will be later, but reading we should have now. Otherwise, it is difficult to write something and not read it, huh? it will be difficult to work out. So, let us give some name, this is called negation first symbol is called negation, which you may read at not, its meaning will be something like not letter. Huh? Then this symbol, which is a wedge, it is called a wedge also. So, we will read it as all conjunction or rather we will have a name as conjunction, we will read as and. Okay. Then this symbol which you write as V in LaTeX, huh? so we will give a name to it as disjunction and we will read it as R as usual. Huh? Similarly, this one side arrow, right arrow, so we will give a name, so call it conditional. You can read it as implies arrow or if then 
somewhere, but nothing is so precise there. Uh, conditional is the best. Let us read as implies. Fine. Last one, which is double arrow, will give a name by conditional, and we can read it as if and only if or if. So, there was something like you can say it is as fifth, huh? it is from if this way and the phi this way, right. So, what we will use IFF, this is traditional again to write IFF, not FIF. Huh? Okay, so, these are the symbols we are introducing slowly. There are some other symbols like which will be our propositions. We have top we have bottom. So, read them as top, bottom. Okay. Next, we will have some list of infinitely many symbols now, P 0, P 1, P 2 and so on. So, these are called atomic propositions. But we will give a different name. We will set these things as propositional variables. So, these will be called as propositional variables. And both these together will be called as atomic propositions. So, we are just varying a little bit, but it will be useful for us. So, in that sense, these two symbols are called propositional constants. Okay. So, it is something like telling uh, Jack is a name. Okay. Then you say good is an adverb or adjective and so on. We do not know what is the meaning of noun or proper name or adjective, we are just giving some names. right? So, we are going to define a grammar that is how it will be precisely formulated. Okay? So, all the symbol we are going to use are given here. They will be punctuation marks, left parenthesis, right parenthesis, connectives, these five connectives and then propositional constants top and bottom, then propositional variables p 0, p 1, p 2 and so on. Right? All these together is our alphabet of the language. Just like in English language, you have the alphabet which contains the symbols a, b, c, d and so on, but every string is not a word. There are some strings which will say they are words, they will be found in the dictionary, others are not words. Okay? The same way but there is a difference. The natural language grows, it includes something, here nothing will be included static. Huh? Once defines, that is it. So, now we are going to define what that, what those particular strings are, where we are interested. Fine? And we have to take care of that example. No malformation is there, it should be well formed, so that we can assign meaning later. Okay? So, how to declare the grammar now? It is done in a very cryptic way. For example, your Bacchus now form. We can say all the propositions are generated this way. If you look at the grammar, it is so simple as this, only one line gives the grammar, but to read it will be more difficult. Huh? That is the reason we have written it very cryptically, but once you are acquainted, it will be easier to write it in this form. 
here what happens is first three things top bottom and p i they are from the alphabet okay so there is nothing to worry about it we know what they are the problem comes when you read this symbol not w it says w can be not w right that is the cryptic thing in fact every instance of this w can be different that's what we have to remember right so you can read it the other way let w stand for any proposition now start reading so any proposition can be top or bottom or a propositional variable or negation followed by another proposition not necessarily same w okay or a left parenthesis a proposition and another proposition a right parenthesis or now you can read it that's what it means so when you write it in terms of formation rules you may have to write four or five sentences but let's write it to make it clear hmm? so it says something like this a proposition can be top or bottom or a propositional variable so in another way you can tell it you can just declare it like every atomic proposition is a proposition that's another way of writing the same thing okay because top bottom and propositional variables all of them are called as atomic propositions so next we have to take care of the connectives if x is a proposition then not x is also a proposition now you can see its translation in the grammar w can be not w that's how we have to write it in english then all the other things we can write if x and y are propositions then x and y x or y x implies y x if y are propositions then there is one more rule which i am not writing here but we must remember that is the fr4 formation rule 4 which says nothing is a proposition unless it has been generated by application of one of these three rules huh? we just close there nothing else is a proposition unless you declare it you may say yes something else is also a proposition hmm see there was once a lecture going on in logic so one person wanted to convince the students that there is something called non monotonicity in our arguments right monotonicity means if you have some assumptions you have concluded something from it now if you take different assumptions along with the earlier assumptions the earlier conclusion still is a conclusion right that's monotonicity but that is violated in some cases to show it he has presented some argument and then proved that a cow has two legs right it's coming because you are not following non monotonicity you are monotonically arguing that's why this is happening a cow has two legs then there was a student there who just answered yes a cow has two legs is it not now the intention is it has four legs so it has also two legs it has also one leg right so we do not want such things to happen that's why we need a closure rule nothing else is a proposition unless 
it has been generated by applications of one of these rules. Okay, we are not writing it, but it is there implicitly. So now I think you understood what is the meaning, how to not meaning exactly, how to generate a proposition starting from our alphabet. Not every string is a proposition, but the strings which are in these forms alone will be considered as propositions. Okay, but the definition is in a sense recursive. Okay, like your definition of factorial function, right? Not as a product of from one to n, but n factorial equal to n times n minus one factorial. Okay, because it uses the word proposition again. Right, so it uses the symbol P R O P. Where, when you read X and Y are propositions, it means if X and Y belong to prop, then X and Y with parentheses belong to prop. So that prop now as a symbol is being overused. So it is recursive. But we see that it is not ill-defined. It is recursive, but well defined, right? Well, what we want is not only this well definedness. We want that there is no ambiguity, because finally we have to resolve whether it is this bracket or it is this bracket. That we have to resolve. So that means the brackets itself, the parentheses themselves, should tell which one we have taken. We should not have to insert the new parentheses, right? It should not be ambiguous. That is our aim. So we'll go slowly towards that. Fine. Once we do that, then our syntax will be complete. We can go for giving meanings. We can connect to the reality. This is our thought now. Okay. It's not in the reality. We have just created the symbols. And now we have to play with the symbols to bring to a certain place where there is no ambiguity. That is our first concern. So let's see. How a proposition is generated, whether some any string is a proposition or not. Say I start with top implies bottom. Is it a proposition? Yes. It is not a proposition. If it is a proposition, tell me in which way we have generated it. Top is a proposition, yes. Bottom is a proposition, yes. Then, hmm? it is not a proposition, right? So I can generate a proposition with the top and bottom the same sequence, but with parentheses. Without it, I cannot generate by following the rules of the grammar. Fine. Therefore, this is a proposition, but this is not. Right? I can say. P one is a proposition. Okay, what about this? It is not a proposition, right? Once there is parenthesis, there should be some connective, not the negation, the other connectives. So let's give a name. We call negation as negation or a unary connective. Others are binary connectives because they always take two things, right? So we need a binary connective whenever there are parentheses. There is no connective here. Why binary connective? So this is not a proposition. Okay. Is it a proposition? Well, if it is a proposition, then my next question will be: Show me how you have generated it. If it is not a proposition, then what should be my next question? Huh? How do you make it? How do you show it's not a proposition? That's a tricky thing to decide. Huh? <coughs> if we can show it to be ambiguous, then maybe. Huh? So you have to decide something on ambiguity. When do you say it is ambiguous? There is no meanings yet. The overall proposition can take. That is giving meaning. So if we can add parenthesis and make a proposition, 
then this is not a proportion. Then it was not a proportion earlier, right? Well, that looks all right. But where to add? There can be many ways of adding. Any one will do. It is a non deterministic algorithm now. Huh? There is a complicated thing, right? Well, let us start with a proposition and see how does it go. This looks like to be a proposition. Let us try to find out why do you say it is a proposition. Yeah. So, I could have started this way say P 2 is a proposition okay, by F R 1, P 3 is a proposition again by F R 1, then P 2 or P 3 with parenthesis is a proposition by F R 3. Okay. So, let me write this on the top of it I say P 2 or P 3. Okay. From these two propositions, I have got this proposition applying formation rule 3. Is that okay? Next, what I do? I take P 1 as a proposition. Therefore, not P 1 is a proposition. Since these two are propositions, I can use implies symbol and get a proposition not P 1 implies P 2 or P 3 this is a proposition. Now, I know that P 0 is a proposition therefore, the original one given is a proposition. Right? Now, you can see it as a tree yeah. So, this is the parse tree of the string that is assumed to be a proposition. Now, given a string you can parse like this and you see that this is the only way of parsing it. There is no other way you could have formed it, right. But if it is not a proposition, what is happening? Let us come back to what you told, it is not a proposition. What will happen here? If you try to parse it, hmm? so you must see what is happening in parsing to proceed. Let us again go back try to see what is happening in parsing to show that this is a proposition we must find, find that the left one that is P 0 is a proposition the right one is also a proposition the left right of connective implies. Right? So, it is really unfolding the formation rules slowly when you form it you form this way starting from the atomic propositions here P 0, P 1, P 2, P 3, right. But when you parse it, you unfold the other way and that makes it difficult in the parsing. It is a tricky affair because you have to first find out which one was applied last that is to be unfolded, fine. So, let us try to find out which could have been the last application of a formation rule, fine. So, that means in order that it is a proposition, it has to match in one of those forms, right. It will be top, bottom, or not of some proposition, and so on. Which one it can match? It is starting with a parenthesis. So, FR3 must have been used at the end. Now, if FR3 has been used, what could be the connective? Now, you can see if you start from left, you get this as the connective. If you start from right, it can be this considering this parenthesis, right. But that is also tricky, it is recursive. First, we have to show this itself can be taken as a unit, then only you can come to this, fine. Okay. Keeping that to heuristics, let us try to see it from the left. Now, if I see it from the left, we can parse it with this as the connective P0 and the other one is P 1 
if not P2 or P3. Fine. This is an atomic proposition. So, it ends there. Now, we come to this place. Here, I cannot parse it further. Right? Because this is neither an atomic proposition nor starting with a left parenthesis. So, nothing can be done. I stop there. Right? Now, if you have taken this one as the connective, you would have got a different tree. Right? So, it would start from this way, where 1 will be p 0 implies p 1, the other one is with parenthesis not p 2 or p 3. So, there are really two pass trees here, none of them is giving a proposition at its leaves, right. All the leaves must be propositions in order that parsing is correct, fine. So, there might be ambiguity in parsing or even if you parse it, it can have a leaf which is not a proposition, then you say it is not a proposition, okay. Is that clear? So, you can write an algorithm now to determine given any expression from our alphabet, given any string over our alphabet, whether it is a proposition or not. Yeah. Can you write? See all that you have to do is identify which one is a proposition inside it somewhere. Fine. You could have started identifying this. So, not P 2 is a proposition because P 2 is atomic. So, now this not P 2 I can forget write is some P 100 instead of it and proceed right. Because all that we do in parsing is unfolding the formation rules. So, now once not P 2 has been accepted as a proposition P 2 should have been accepted as a proposition P 2 is because it is atomic. So, you can start the other way C P 2 atomic identify not P 2 then think of that as a proposition. So, replace not P 2 by something else say P 2 does not matter you do not have to invent symbols fine. Now, if you do that what happens for this? any other bracket one more parenthesis. So, what we identify is one of the substrings of this is in the form not P 2. So, this not P 2 I can replace with P 2. So, now I get after the replacement now there are connectives and I can find out which connective I should take, so that it will become, it will become unified with one of our rules that is important. So, I can take this one as an atomic and the other one is also there, but it is may or may not be unified provided the other one is also a proposition right. So, I will not proceed that way, I will proceed with a substring which matches with a proposition right. So, I will identify this one which is a proposition because P 2 is P 3 is P 2 or P 3 with parenthesis is. Then I replace that with P 2 ok. Now, my algorithm stops there because this whole expression cannot be identified with any of the propositions. If I take P 1 here implies here then the whole thing should have been a proposition but it is not, but to make the algorithm better not depending on finding out whether this is a proposition or not, what you will be doing? You will not stop here, you will proceed thinking that this is also a proposition starting from the left right. 
okay. So, we will be continuing this way say p 1 is 1 this is another. So, this should have been some x, but it is not a proposition that is why we cannot take that way you have to stop here. In order that one rule will be applied each one of these two components should have been propositions this is a proposition, but this is not. So, no way algorithm stops there. So, it looks that this procedure can be used to determine whether any given string is a proposition or not. Okay. Just go on replacing by following the formation rules, but then what really allowed us to proceed this far? There are some properties in a proposition which this allowed otherwise you would not have come to this test. So, the first property there is left and right parenthesis are matching in any proposition that is easy to see is it ok can you see that take any proposition number of left parenthesis equal to number of right parenthesis yes or you need a proof for this. Take an example first, see whether it is all right. Now, proof will not be difficult because a proposition has been formed by using the formation rules, and in each of the formation rules, you see matching of the parenthesis is there. Therefore, whatever you get from this recursively will have the matching of parenthesis. So, the proof is by induction, a formal proof is by induction again because every step you are increasing the length of the proposition or the string. Okay. So, I lived it here, but we note it down as a property of propositions. If W is a proposition, then the number of left parenthesis equals the number of right parenthesis in W. Okay. It is an easier property. Next property is a bit difficult, but you can still find it out. You consider a proposition, look at the example we have already worked out read it from the left take any prefix of it. Okay. Do you see something is happening there? Well, tell me about parenthesis. Hmm? Totally is matched that is fine I am asking about the prefix of a proposition. Number of left is always greater than the number of left. Can you see that? Yeah. Is it strict? Greater than or equal to? Huh? Greater than or equal to is fine. But is it strict? Is it greater than always? Yes. If it is a proper prefix, right? Because the prefix can be the whole string also. Prefix means you are reading it from the left side, stopping at somewhere. If you stop only at the end, you get the whole. Right? There you will have number same. But before that number of left parenthesis must be bigger than number of right parenthesis provided there are parenthesis right. You can have only negation symbols and then p i is it right. So, you can have an example of a proposition like not 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 p 0 there is no parenthesis you take any prefix of it you will get only nots huh? any proper prefix is that clear. So, now how do you formulate second rule? It is about the prefix of a proposition. Yes, if u is a prefix of w and w is a proposition, then what happens in u? you can be what 
you are talking of a proper prefix, right. So, let us take u is a proper prefix, then what happens? Yes. So, that means u can be empty string, that is one triviality we have to see, or u can be a sequence of knots equal to only a sequence of knots, right, or number of left parentheses in u is strictly greater than number of right parenthesis in u. is greater than okay now if you do not take a proper prefix then there is the other possibility that you can be equal to w right so let's remove this and make it proper by removing this proper huh? or you can be equal to w. Is that okay? In fact, this last property can be formulated in a different way. You can just say that if u and w are both propositions and u is a prefix of w, then u has to be equal to w, it is slightly cryptic. Huh? Okay? If you take both u and w as propositions and u is a prefix of w, then u has to be equal to w. No proper prefix of a proposition can be a proposition, this is what it said, is that right? So, you can utilize these properties to prove that our grammar is unambiguous. Okay. So, now what is that we are going to prove? Let us formulate it first, our grammar is unambiguous. That means, if a proposition has been formed, then its parse tree is unique, it cannot have a different parse tree than what you have got already. Right? So, this means, if a proposition has been formed, then the way it has been formed is the only way it could have been formed. Is that okay? So, if a proposition is already formed, there is only one way you can read it. All these things tell the same thing. That is why the theorem you are going to prove is called unique formation theorem, unique parsing theorem, or unique readability theorem, whatever way you want to look at it. Fine? So, let us state the theorem first. It says each proposition is uniquely parsed you take any proposition so proposition means it is a string over the alphabet having possibly some parentheses some connectives some propositional constants and some propositional variables. It is a finite in length, right? If you count the symbols, it will be finite number because they are strings. Now, you say it is a proposition, means all the rules have been applied, not exactly all the rules, right? Only some of the rules could have been applied, but only from those rules we have applied some. Then, after application, you have got another string 
that string is your proposition now. Your concentration is on that particular string, what you have obtained. Now, you say the way you have obtained it is the only way you could have got it. No other way the same thing could have been arrived at. Right? So, what is the meaning of this way? The way you have obtained it means what? Means you have identified from the atomic propositions which one to choose. Top is there, bottom is there, P 0 is there or P 100 is there, how many P 100s are there and so on. First study is that you have chosen the atomic propositions. After choosing the atomic propositions, you identify their occurrences. So, this is my first occurrence of P 0, this is second occurrence of P 0 and so on. In an order it has been written. Then you combine which one with what using which connective that combination is done. After the combination you go to the second step of combining the newly obtained ones with the old ones or all the new ones and so on. Slowly you continue that is the way you have obtained. Now, you are going to say that that is the only way anyone could have obtained this proposition. Nobody else can obtain it in any other way. Right? So, here if you define or look at the set of propositions in a different way, it tells you the meaning of this way of obtaining it. So, we could have defined propositions in altogether a different way instead of the formation rules. Right? Our formation rule 1 says that all atomic propositions are by definition propositions. So, we write that as prop 0 without any connectives. Right? Then we go to prop 1 which will have at best one connective. Right? Then prop 2 including prop 0 and prop 1 you put another connective. So, you can really generate that way is it fine. Hmm? So, let us see it that way. See I can define prop 0 subscript 0 let us say okay. this is equal to top bottom P 0 P 1 and so on. Then I can say if prop i has been defined okay, we can change it prop i plus 1 equal to prop i union something will be generated basing on elements of prop i not x or you can say x and y or you can say x or y or x implies y or x if y such that x y are in prop i. Okay. So, we are generating is level by level. So, this i here indeed gives you the depth in that parse tree. Can you see? So, the leaf level will be covered by prop 0, go to the next level that will be covered by prop 1 and so on. So, that gives you the depth. Then finally, you say that prop or the set of all propositions is equal to union of all these. So, recall n is our set of natural numbers including 0. Okay. So, this is what you are doing when you do parsing, you are doing it level by level in the trees. So, this is also another alternative definition of prop, but it is required to be proved. Huh? Again, proof will be by induction that what you generate here is a proposition and then from the other side every proposition is there in some level right because it is finite that also can be done fine now what about the proof of unique parsing
so you have to think a bit right see how to proceed with this so what we have done till now yes one sentence i want we have simply defined what prop is right we have understood what unique parsing is 